Well, Mark, here we go again with another yeah. month of questions. Um, let's get straight into the first one. Add boards too bright again during the midweek game. Struggling to see the ball inside the 18-yard box, what can be done from multiple fans. But contrary view, just to show that not everybody sees it the same, is they look good. Can we have them all the way around the ground? Yeah, as you, as you just alluded to there, um, and you, you get copied in a lot of the emails that I get, The it's pretty split. Um, quite a lot of fans don't like the boards, quite a lot do. Um, I think if you look at Champions League games, Premiership games, um, championship games and, and a lot of League One games now. You know the the ad boards, the revolving ad boards are, are here to stay. They are a good source of revenue. Um, it's not something we can turn down. But I'm, I'm in the the camp of can we can we turn the lights down? I know that during a game now people have got used to it. And we seem to have got the levels right. But yeah, they did look bright to me on Tuesday. And and for the next game, it's something that we'll look at and hopefully turn the contrast contrast down slightly. Maybe people just aren't used to technology coming to Fratton Park. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I always find the one, I don't know if anyone else is, has noticed it, when, when you watch your premiership games and they've got the dog running around with a ball. Mm-hmm. And it just, that just completely takes my eye away from the game sometimes. I don't know how players cope with that. And we've not arrived at that stage yet. But, but yeah, some of the ads that were on there on uh, Tuesday and, and you know where I sit, I'm looking trying to keep my eye on everything going on around. I did look and go, I thought that was a little bit bright. So in answer to the question, it is something that we will be looking to tone down for the next game, night time okay. game. OK, OK. Changing tack <clears throat> straight away. Um, and this has come over the last, in a couple of days, a few people have asked this. If we gain promotion, mm. what would be the club's goal next season? Survival, mid-table, playoff? or immediate promotion to the championship? So, in other words, what kind of budget? So budgets don't always guarantee you success. Um, for a club like Portsmouth, given, you know, please, we, we get promoted this year and we do end up in League One, I think our aspiration will be to try and go again into the championship. You know, we're a progressive club. We're an ambitious club. Um Budgetary wise, and and it's a, it's a great relevant question because I, I've found out today <clears throat> the average budget in, in what they are this year in the leagues, and uh, I think people will be surprised that we could only really deliver a mid-table budget in League One, where we have one of the biggest budgets in League Two. Um, by the time we get to to League One and and the resources that the the um, relevant owners in that league are pumping into their clubs, we would probably only have a mid table budget but that doesn't mean we wouldn't obviously be going to at least try and get into the playoffs you know and and, because that's our ambition of where we want to go as a club Um, but whilst I'm on that subject with with League Two I think that maybe I failed in in not getting the message out clearly enough that as we currently stand um, we are one of three clubs that, that are there more or less the same at the top end um, but then just literally just below that, there's another five or six clubs um, that that have budgets not dissimilar to ours. You know, they're just slightly below. So it's not like a Rangers situation when Rangers were in the full third tier of, of Scottish football where they had a budget of, let's say, it was around figure 10 million. The next biggest was 500,000 where they were blowing it away. That has never been the case since since we've been in League Two. And and predominantly the reason for that is that the, the other clubs um, tend to have, you know, owners that, that are even at League Two level pumping in millions of pounds per year, suffering millions of pounds of losses overall in, in trying to match, to trying to get their budget to be as, as big as it can in this league. So it is tough. And as I say, maybe I failed in not pulling that expectation back slightly to say, look, we are not blowing this league away financially. We are one of nine or ten overall clubs that are within spitting distance of each other in regards of budget. Uh, yeah, there, there, there is this belief out there, popular belief sometimes, that we've gone from paupers to princes. Mm. Not yeah, the case. No, no, no. Um, it's, I mean, I was listening to Barry Hearn on TalkSport this morning, and for all the criticism at Leighton Orient, and, and by the way, he was heavily critical of the, the current ownership at, at Leighton Orient, he did point out that... <laughs> He was given four million, I mean, I'm not speaking out of turn here. This is what he said on TalkSport. So I'm only repeating what Barry Hearn said, that in the last two and a half years, he was given four million pound cash for the club 
and that the new owners have put in eight, eight, approximately eight million pound additional to that. Mm. Now, when you think that our overall gate receipts are only three million odd, and we've got a servant to pull that, and then you've had an owner at Leighton Orient who's put in eight million, it gives you some idea of what we are up against as a fair known club. And I'm not knocking that structure because I think it's absolutely brilliant. But unfortunately for us, and Leighton Orient's not a great example, by the way, um, but every owner that comes in and pumps more and more money into that relevant club, potentially trying to run the club the right way, and that's what we're trying to do, break even, not looking for external investment, yeah? We gradually fall down the, the pecking order. So, and people realize this is our fourth season now. Mm. What was the average budget in League Two, League One four seasons ago, yeah? Um, because of inflation and the more investment that is coming in externally, um, our, what's the word, uh, competitiveness financially is gradually being eroded because during that time as well, we haven't increased season ticket prices, um, CMB's gone up very negligibly, negligible, you know, increase in, in prices there and that had quite a big backlash when I tried to do that. But over that four year period, you've now got the national minimum wage, that's gone up. Um, running costs have all gone up, inflation, you know, everything's costing more and more money. But what we're trying to do is being a responsible fans own club is not try and pass that expense on to supporters. So mm. really, that, I'm not saying that's holding us back and I'm not being critical of it as a stress because our fans are brilliant. And, and I'm sure, you know, given the opportunity, they would be there willing and able to do that. So, but I think just to answer the question, unless we start getting some new investment in or realise that we've got to start putting prices up here, there and everywhere to compete, then unfortunately we will start falling down even further down the pecking order financially. Mm. Not as a club because, you know, mm. you know, we're a massive club. No, you can't doubt that. But I'm just talking in purely financial terms. And Orient really are a prime case, um, almost a mini Pompey in the fact that owner puts a lot of money in, mm. owner gets disinterested or owner money is frozen yeah, yeah, yeah. and then yeah. they're in the problems they are. Yeah, I think well, it's bigger than that. Sometimes it's owner gets disinterested because he gets a little bit of stick and thinks, why am I putting all this money in and, <clears throat> and I'm getting criticised for it, you know? Um, but they are a poor example of, of, of an owner coming. There's plenty of other very good examples of good owners that have progressed clubs mm. through the leagues, you know, and, and they don't have them issues. It, it's always down to the individual or the group that, that gets involved with the football club. In our case, we have got the fans. They own the club. Mm. Um, and in four years, and the stress that again, apart from saying to supporters um, about the training ground, which everyone stepped up to the plate, did great, for the, run, the overall running of the football club, and for any other investment that's been required at the football club, you know, whether that be in infrastructure, players, whatever, we've never, ever once gone to the fan base. We are trying to run the club in a sustainable manner. But mm. every time someone comes in, a good, rich owner at other clubs, and he's prepared to pump in, you know, two, three, four, five, fifteen, twenty million pounds a year, depending on what league you're in, we invariably, financially, fall further down the pecking order mm. to the point where... The budget I believe we could deliver in League One that is now mid-table, four years ago, it would have been a playoff budget. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. Four years ago, the budget I believe we can deliver in the championship, yeah, would have given us a fighting chance of staying up. Now we'll be stone bottom of the table mm. in, in regards of. So that's unfortunately what has happened. I mean... Some of the championship clubs, and I won't name names, but I know one particular owner over a three-year period has put in £80 million. Mm. That's just, you can't even, when you think in the championship, a total turnover before cost, before pay players, anything would probably be somewhere in the region of £14 million, £15 million. Mm. You've got one owner that's put in £80 million, apart from the run cost and turnover of, of, the, of the business. So they've had all that income in, as well as... £80 million. Pound. It's just, just mind-boggling, the, the money that is now out there in football. And our, our real realistic chance of progressing now is that more and more clubs that touch wood, you know, you don't want it to happen, but from our point of view, selfishly, you really need more clubs to, to collapse and become fan-owned so that we're on an equal playing field with them. You know, mm. and then they'll be working under the same constraints that we are. Um, but no, it's, listen, that's, that's a discussion that, you know, I think 
that should be out there that, that needs to be aired. And, and you know, when I go to the supporters club meeting with you year on year, I've, I've sort of more or less said that, that had the same message. Mm. But as I say, year on year, unfortunately, we are becoming less and less um, powerful financially because we're up against other clubs that unfortunately, you know, their owners are willing to put in X amount of millions each year. They say never go back. We've yep. seen a few prime examples of Pompey. <clears throat> Joe on Instagram says, are we signing Lua Lua? <laughs> never say never, <laughs> as well as never say go back. Um, I know that Paul, Liam, you know, have spoken to, to, to his agent. Um, ultimately, it'll be a decision between Paul, the player, and, and if something can be done and, and Paul wants to do it, then obviously we'd do what we can to support him. But again, it's a footballing decision. But never say never. OK, now if you want an ace coach, um, Colin on Facebook's one, can I come down to the training ground and give a session to the strikers and show them where the goal is? Yeah, please. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, listen, I think it's one of them things that even I've Paul said it after, after games, yeah, that, that there is a need to be more clinical in front of goal. I do have great belief in our strikers. Um, like everyone else, you know, we did, we did miss chances on, on Tuesday night and it was frustrating, but... Honestly, I, I do genuinely believe we've got great strikers, we've got a great squad. Um, thanks for the offer, by the way. Um, but, you know, we've got Robbie Blake now, who, who's, you know, there full-time, helping out with the strikers, as, amongst others. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite relaxed about that. You know, if they're going to miss them, miss them all in one go in, in a game, and, you know, hopefully we'll be all right for the running. You probably inadvertently answered Colin, um, no, sorry, play up Pompey on Twitter. Mm. Is there a replacement for Ian Foster lined up for this season? Or is that something which will be sorted in the summer? I think it's something that will be sorted in the summer. Again, you know, it's, it's not down to money or anything. It was down to, to Paul taking the decision. You say there. Robbie Blake's moved up there. Yeah, he, did, he didn't really want anyone coming in at, at this late stage with a couple of months ago till the end of the season. Um, he's quite happy with the setup. He's got there, you know, more responsibilities falling on, on Robbie now generally. Robbie was always here, as you say, helping the strikers. But for the under-23 games, he stepped up into Ian Foster's role. And, you know, it, it's a great opportunity for Robbie. But is it, there's nothing official there. It's just Robbie's really picking up the slack from from what, where Fozzy was. And, and, it, and, and Paul took the decision. There was no need to bring anyone else in and rock the boat because everyone was were in a great place as a club on and off the pitch. And, you know, he didn't feel the need to, to really rock that boat at the moment. Any chance of a second scoreboard around the ground? Depending on where you are situated in the ground, it's difficult to see it and know how long it's gone. Multiple fans. Yeah, I think it's something we look at in the summer. Um, I'm assuming, I mean, the clock above the Milton end, if they're talking about the time. Um, <clears throat> so I'm presuming there is, a, obviously, the Milton end, you can't see it if you're sat in the Milton end because you'd be sat behind it. But there must be other areas that, that you know, it can't be viewed mm. from or, or a tight angle. So it's something we can look at. In the summer, but again, they are expensive. Yeah, very expensive. Yeah, come yeah. back to the old. Yeah, and and they're expensive to service and, and keep running. You know, during the season, they're always going wrong for some reason, and that's why they're quite expensive to to, to keep running. Yeah. Okay, and Tony via email. Mm. Why don't we have any prominent signage at the training ground when Rocco have their branding and signs all along the frontage? I think when we struck the agreement with Rocco. They were keen that it wasn't a Pompey takeover. You know, they're running a business there, a separate entity business next to us. So they didn't want us to basically um, just become the dominant factor in, at that complex. Um, there is a few bits of, of, of Pompey advertising, but as well, I think I, I always very careful that, you know, it's it's not really a place you want to advertise as saying, look, this is our Pompey training ground. You know, this is where we keep our balls. This is where we keep our kit, you know, at night type thing. So <clears> it, it's, it, there, there is a combination of both. But we we have got permission to put a few other signs up. And again, in the summer, they, they are due to go up. OK. Now, a really relevant question in my mind. Pompey fans are known to be <clears> passionate. Yeah. Yet there is a minority that have high, ex high expectations that we only need to turn up to win. Do you agree with me that some fans need to be more realistic or else it can be detrimental to the goals of the club, says Andy via email? Ooh. I think it can be detrimental when um, it, it becomes 
a factor during the game, i.e. we're nil-nil on 60 minutes. Um, we should be beating this team, you know, because we're Pompey. And, and then you can feel the pressure. I can feel the pressure building on me and I'm not a player. You know, and I know a lot of other people feel the same. However, to combat that, you know, I don't think Pompey fans should ever try to diminish their expectation in, in what they expect from, from the players in the club. Um, we are a big club. We should have high expectations, you know, um, but we have to be realistic. So there's a, there's a difference between realism and expectation, in my view, as, as you go back to the League One argument as such that, that, that I put earlier on. The reality is we're probably going to have a mid-table League One budget. That's the realism. Mm. But our expectation should still be to, tr to try and get out of the league. Mm. It's just when your expectations don't marry up to, to the realities of the situation. So, listen, everyone's entitled to an opinion. Um, I've always said that. As long as their opinion is based on facts. So, when you say, yeah, we should be running away with League Two, our budget's three times the next team I've read. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's not fact. So you're basing your expectation on 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 a like a Donald Trump false news, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I wanted to get that in there, but no. But d does that make sense? Yeah? If, yeah. if you've got all the facts at your disposal, which is why I come on here and, and try and put them facts out there, then people can make their own judgment on what what is real and what is is expected. So. Um, I don't, and, and, but you should never try to dampen expectation as long as it doesn't become to such a point where, to the detriment of the club, it, it becomes a weight, an unnecessary weight on you that is unrealistic. Because mm. Michael Doyle made a very good point when I was talking to him the other day. Mm -hmm. He said that some player, he hears fans say, sign that player and sign that player because they're doing well at a particular club. He said not all of them can then come to Fratton Park and live no, up to that expectation. Totally agree with you. I think it is a different animal at Fratton Park. Um, and I think that's in in the case of managers as well. You know, when, when you've managed clubs not of the size and stature of Portsmouth to come here and then fall under them pressures, you know, you, and realise that fans hang on your every word and, and they're trying to interpret what you say all the time, you know, um, you don't get them pressures at, you know, with the greatest respect, clubs that don't have 18,000 turn mm. up at games you know if mm. you only get three or four thousand you can go to your local pub have a beer go home no one says anything mm. you know you do that in Pompey and all of a sudden people are making all sorts of accusations about you you know it's that's just the nature of the beast um, mm. but you know Paul says it great if you, if you can't stand the heat you shouldn't be in the kitchen and by coming to Pompey and getting I would argue we pay a premium for players to attract them down on the south coast and the second they know Pompey are involved, they don't suddenly cut their wage demands, they up their wage demands. Yeah. And as a player, if you accept that, then it comes with a territory. You've got to come down here and perform, and perform in front of big gates with high expectations. Mm. Are we officially... but I'm, I'm just going to say, to, to back up Michael, yes, it is difficult if you're not the right type of person. Yeah. Some people can step up and, and s smell that passion and, and 18,000 people and go... This is my stage. I'm gonna step up to the plate. Big game players, or mm -hmm. others can shrink and crumble and go into their shell and then make all kinds of excuses. You know, we just got to hope that we get the right type of players. You make the, make the point that there were people like John Akinde here and John Marquis yep. that are scoring goals for fun now, but but when they were here, mm -hmm. they never really looked like it. Is that part yeah. of it? I think I think there is a part of that, but in what you've mentioned there. Um, if I use John Marquis as an example, yeah, if I dare say if we'd have said we're going to sign John at the start of the season, there would have been huge disappointment amongst mm. Pompey fans based on the spell that he was here. Now, mm. personally, I know that John is a good good player. Yeah, mm. Unfortunately, when players come to Pompey, they get a very, very short time span, and I'm, I'm thinking of a current player at the moment when I say that, of four or five games where if you don't hit the ground running and you don't suddenly start scoring goals for fun, people think you're no good. Yeah, yeah. You suddenly become bad or you lose four or five games as a manager. Suddenly you're you're not a good manager anymore. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. And I, I think, But I don't think that's just that Pompey anymore, unfortunately. I think that's football generally where you can very, very quickly go from hero to zero but conversely, the good point is that you can very, very quickly go back to a hero again. You know, good managers 
over a period of time have bad spells. Good players over a period of time have bad spells that don't make them bad players or bad managers. Oh, hey!